So we're going to get some chairs up on stage, along with our wonderful panelists. Um, while we're doing that, while we're getting set up, um, we're going to talk a bit about building with empathy. I would imagine not many of you guys talk about this on a daily basis or in your uh, 2018 planning or anything like that. So I thought it's been a couple of minutes just teeing up what that means and, and some perspectives on what we're going to talk about. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Um, the American Association of Psychology <laughs> proposes it's the defining trait that makes us human. Um, and the, the absence of which uh, enables things like oppression, persecution, violence, warfare, all the rotten things in life. Um, so I think on a personal level, uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, we would all, we all agree that it's an incredibly important quality and something that I hope we all, we all try to exude in daily lives. But what does it mean on a business level? What does it mean if you're building products, making decisions every day? Can you do that with empathy? And, and does it matter? Should you do that? What are, what are the costs of, of not doing that or doing that? Um, and there are really kind of two key perspectives to think about this. One is, as the business decision maker or the product decision maker, um, can you be empathy driven? You know, we talk about data driven all the time and we use it as a, as a positive trait. You know, he's data driven and he's amazing. Um, but we rarely talk about being empathy driven and thinking about that in your decision making. And an example that came to mind um, when thinking about this was Wonder Bread. And I don't know how many, I didn't grow up in the US, so for me, Wonder Bread was kind of a, a revelation when I moved, moved here. I've never tasted it. But um, they, they pioneered sliced bread in the 1920s. You know, they, they, were kind of a, seen as a huge innovator in the food industry. Uh, the, t the term, the best thing since sliced, bre sliced bread, was from Wonder Bread. Uh, they saw huge success in the 19 1950s and 60s. About 25 to 30% of American caloric intake was Wonder Bread. Um, nothing, nothing has been as prolific since then. You know, not, not Coca-Cola, not high fructose corn syrup. Um, in 2012, they filed for bankruptcy. And you know, obviously, many many reasons for that. But one of the main reasons that's suggested is the rise of health food, organic food, as Evelyn was mentioning, um, greater awareness. And if you were a product manager at Wonder Bread in the 1950s, and you proposed to do an A/B test to sell whole wheat bread, I wonder how many of us would have, would have been successful with the A/B test, or whether the leadership of the company would have been, oh, it's a great idea, go ahead with that. And I think that what, what, what's, what's, what's interesting is that often there can be a trade-off potentially between performance and building a better experience, a more enriching experience for your users, and how do you, how do you make that trade-off, and how do you even know if you're going in the right direction? And the other perspective, which is incredibly relevant to you all as technology um, product managers, decision makers, um, is the need to build products with empathy. Um, now with the rise of voice search, we're seeing over a billion voice queries on Google now per week. Um, with a assistance and, and AI and new models of engaging with users and natural language processing, users expect your product to behave like a person. And more than that, to behave like a friend. And your friend isn't always nice to you. Um, your friend is not robotic, kind of answering in binary ones and zeros. Your friend understands you. And the same, you don't expect the same. Uh, so uh, Isha might have a friend who she expects to behave a certain way. I have a, a different expectation, like we saw in the IDEO video. So it's a very challenging, challenging problem. So with that, I would love to introduce my three wonderful panelists. Um, as you guys do quick intros, I'm going to scan through uh, images of your products so you guys can, can, uh, can talk a bit about that. Go ahead. Great. Um, well, thanks for having us here today. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Isha Gupta. I am a co-founder and the director of content at Hooked, which is a chat fiction app. Um, we currently have 30 million readers. And our goal with Hooked is to redefine the way that um, people read and write and, and consume fiction stories on their phones. Hi, I'm Sam Mandel. I'm the CEO of Poncho. I'm also a partner at Betaworks, which is a startup studio in New York where Poncho was created. Um, our goal with Poncho was to create a new weather service aimed at millennials and younger people. But as we thought about what that meant, we decided we wanted to create sort of a kind of an experience of getting the weather from a friend or a friendly acquaintance or something in that category. And um, we're really trying to do two things. One is figure out 
what it means to have native content for the messaging layer, because we felt like that's where Poncho should really live. And the other is eventually how to build kind of a UI that would work for um, sort of AI backends and how we could bring that sort of friendliness on the front end to um, more data-driven and sort of assembling sort of a data package like weather. Now, one of the ways we do that, we actually have two comedy writers on our team, and they, uh, mm -hmm. they're comedians by night and write for Poncho by day, and they actually write the forecast. But everything else we do with Poncho is sort of done, uh, done algorithmically, both on our, um, on our apps for iOS and Android, and also we, um, we have one of the best uh, chatbots out there on Facebook Messenger and a couple of other platforms. In fact, we just got our Webby Award yesterday. It finally oh. came in the mail, and it said "World's Best Chatbot" on it. So wow. we that's are. awesome. That's cool. Awesome. I hope you're sharing it with Poncho. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Danielle. I run Google's Empathy Lab, and the way that that kind of works at a place like Google is I work with our research and machine intelligence gang, sort of on all of the the guts and the intelligence, the souls of these things. Um, also with the assistant gang. Um, and then I'm deeply embedded in the design um, organization as well because, you know, everybody needs some empathy. So, <laughs> so basically, I, yeah, I, I work um, across all of those teams and connecting those teams kind of as the glue. Um, and a way that I often talk about my work is Google is incredible at IQ. Um, and what we're really starting to build and um, develop at this point is our EQ because you can imagine if our EQ was equal to our IQ, how compelling um, the spaces and I think for this new design paradigm which is about sort of interaction relationship um, it's it's like it is an imperative now rather than something that's just like yeah. oh it's this like squishy layer or like <laughs> sort of like design once was this like great thing that some people got and other people didn't it's like yeah. we're at that stage with this it's like are we gonna acknowledge what's really happening here yeah. so awesome cool well thank you all so much for being here um, Isha, I'd love to start with you. Uh, you know, Hooked, given its, its focus on chat stories, you know, stories are inherently kind of empathetic and all about relating to one another. Was building your products with that in mind and building kind of a personality in your product an obvious endeavor? Or was it something that kind of had to come about and you had to kind of make big product decisions to decide how to, how to do that within the UI? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the short answer to that is it, there, there wasn't a lot of conscious discussion or decision around building um, a personality into the app. I think we think about it more in terms of what is, I guess, the personality of the main character of a story mm -hmm. and how does that speak to the audience we're trying to target that story to. Um, but what I will say, and I just want to circle back and, and kind of piggyback off of the Wonder Bread analogy because I just think it's so good. Um, and it made me, as you were saying it, think about maybe we're kind of experiencing like our Wonder Bread moment with mobile. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, we've sort of had this first slew of apps that have come out that are really addicting and we're using them constantly and they're really entertaining, but perhaps they leave us feeling a little bit dissatisfied um, and, and kind of unhappy at times. Um, you know, we probably, we're at peak social, we're all maybe spending a lot more time on social media than we'd like. Um, and, and that experience, I think, sometimes leaves us feeling just like there's a lack of something. And so in many ways, that that is the reason why we started Hooked. Um, we felt like we wanted to be kind of a whole wheat option. Um, and, you know, there isn't sort of a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of options out there that feel like a nourishing um, alternative to what is out there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I think with that in mind, you know, we thought, okay, well, there are many studies that show that there's a high correlation between the amount of fiction a person consumes and their ability to score high or highly or well on um, tests that measure empathy and social skills and even happiness. And so you take that idea in and of itself, plus just our, the team's personal experience of, of reading and feeling like you're sort of building empathy and, and yeah. in this meditative state. So how do you take those facts um, and experiences and translate them into um, an experience for mobile, basically? And so that's kind of like where our whole journey started. And I think, you know, from our perspective, too, it's like, you can't really expect us to put down our phones. I don't think that we're gonna ever reach a point where we're 
going to live in a digital detox. Um, and so that said, it's sort of like, OK, how do, you, how do you start creating those more nourishing, like whole wheat options that still taste really good and are really, really addicting, but also leave you feeling better than maybe the Wonder Breads of the world? <laughs> I like that you carried that through. Maybe we'll just have goggles, and then, you know, who needs to hold anything? It will be right <laughs> in your face. Um, Sam, you're the token male on the panel, so thank you for being that. Um, <laughs> it's great for a change, I have to say. <laughs> um, so you're, you're approaching this kind of with two hats. You know, Poncho is a startup, and you also advise other companies as well as startups. Um, do you find that given, you know, we're all resource constrained, but especially at a startup, kind of you've got to make trade-offs. Um, do you find it... Have you ever had to make those tough decisions between like, well, we need to really grow our, our, our core metric, whatever that is right now, um, and it could be at the expense of this really enriching, engaging um, you know, uh, experience that we spent all our time building? Or you always kind of know at your heart that the poncho character and investing in that and the comedic side of it is, is always going to trump more money, more, more uh, engagement? You know, we're just reaching that point now in our history. I think up till now it's been easy because really engagement was the core metric we used internally and engagement and retention and we felt like that was the best our goal was to become part of people's daily routine we try, you know we see the average user like twice a day we have very, you know we have i think f by far the highest uh, chatbot retention of of i think any bot and our app retention is, is very very high too and so we sort of those goals and what we were measuring sort of reinforced this idea that we wanted to be friends with the user, not abuse that relationship. We, when we send notifications, we um, specifically design them so you don't have to open them. One of, our, one of the other weather apps sort of sends one saying, like, check out the weather today. And, and we actually give you the weather so that you know, the, our use case paradigm is sort of you're in bed in the morning, you're looking at your texts and messages from your friends, and you have one from Poncho that tells you the weather. And um, so that, that was, you know, we, we, we didn't have to really push it. Now we're now, we're just starting a project where we're gonna try and sell, have Poncho sell things to you. And so we really, um, and we know that not all users are gonna like that, and we have to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, we think of Poncho as a virtual influencer. We wanna build, um, build him up as a character who you can relate to and buy things from. And so the way we've approached that, um, we've done some experiments, and, and, and there was definitely some user pushback. We're now, gonna, we're now doing a bigger series of tests um, basically towards launching a, um, launching a product that's gonna have some Poncho branding on it that we're doing in partnership. And, um, the first thing we did was create sort of a backstory for why it's happening. We have a character bible for Poncho that we've written, and most of that's not really visible to the users. Like, I know Poncho was major in college, which was Canadian film, um, <laughs> but we've, we've never revealed that to the users. But it just <laughs> sort of helps know. us. Um, <laughs> it just helps us sort of get in the mood for like, is this something he would do? Is it something he'd not do? And that has to do with kind of creating someone who. He's sort of a friend, but we think of him as almost between a friend and acquaintance, sort of. Like, he's, you're not, he's not your best friend, but he's somebody you're friendly with. And so we thought, okay, well, why would he be selling this? And, and now, now we're going to go forward and basically do a lot of A-B testing in terms of, with subsets of our users to see what there's the most pushback to. But we always want to be transparent about it. And one of, a big part of that story is going to be that, like, Poncho's rent went up and you know, he lives in Brooklyn, and we have to. Um, he's got to make his rent, and, he's, and his job at Poncho Inc., where he works, is not cutting it. So he's got this kind of side gig, and then we're going to test like how much of that we expose to the users. Because I think, you know, our goal is to sell the product. It's not necessarily to be consistent with um, the story. Although the writers and you know the whole team, the engineers too, we all get into kind of the story, and we always have to fight that temptation to surface too much of that. And our goal is to surface sort of just enough of it um, so that that we don't get this pushback. But we do think of ourselves as, as being sort of in a relationship with the user. And we think that that drives a lot of our retention because people feel like if they delete the Poncho app or something, they just feel, they feel a little guilty about it, is what they people told Poncho. us. And, and so um, we want to approach even sort of things that the user might not, not be, might not be their first choice to see sort of advertising or yep. commerce in Poncho, but we want to be transparent in a way that's true to the character about why we're doing that. And, and that, so we'll just see how that goes. But we're yeah. trying to do that in the same spirit as we've designed the rest of the service. So you talked about testing. Um, and Danielle, I imagine this must be like a Herculean feat at Google to try to get people out of the mindset of purely 
you know, data driven, you know, there's 60, 60 whatever here and 59 here, we're going with the 60. How, how have you approached moving people into more of an EQ measurement um, mindset? And it, are you doing that quantifiably? Have you found ways to do that? Or is it, does it need to be more qualitative and about you know, CSAT and, and softer metrics? It's got to be all of it. I mean, the thing, the, the thing that kind of is uh, like, you know, the, the blessing and the curse of this space is that it's, um, it's invisible. It's, we're trying to literally make things visible that are invisible. Yeah. We're also trying to make things comfortable that are uncomfortable. Like in terms of talking about feelings, it's like I literally will just walk into a room and be like, we're going to talk about feelings today. And people are like <laughs> face melting terror, right? <laughs> so I think what's kind of just tackling that head on and saying humans are messy. There's the rational and the irrational. There's the stuff that makes sense. There's the stuff you can research, the stuff that's unresearchable. Mm -hmm. The whole point of talking to people and understanding the full story, like there was a, there was a great line from um, a psychologist that I work with who was basically like, the only way that you can know a person and to truly know them is when you know their story. So when we look at the full story, some of that is going to be the pattern recognition and the metrics, and some of it is going to be all of the narrative super glue and messiness that kind of makes them in their life. Mm -hmm. And so what I make a big point of doing in my conversations um, with our gang at Google is, uh, is to quote the Martian and science the shit out of it. So <laughs> I, uh, what I tend to do is speak a lot about the way people feel and experience things. And I get into a lot of that. I make a lot of you know, short documentary films that sort of let people tell their own stories. Yeah. And really, when you think about films, you're making feelings like in the, in, in the other person. When you're telling a story, you're making feelings. And so what I try to do is have the, those stories tell themselves. And then there's so much around emotional intelligence and social intelligence and you know the psychology of these spaces that what I find myself doing is instead of trying to invent new metrics mm -hmm. is to look at the metrics that are out there around machine intelligence and the idea of learning someone and growing some you know growing with someone and getting to know them better and a hit or a miss and then fill that in mm -hmm. with things like uh, the Gottman's method so show of hands for folks in the room that know the Gottman's means you all probably have wonderful marriages. Um, so the Gottmans got famous in the 90s for basically they were the people where you could sit down with them for 20 minutes and they would tell you like how long your marriage was going to last. <laughs> they had their love lab. <laughs> like a fortune teller? How would they know? They, they basically, it's, they, they were all the kind of micro gestures ah, and okay. like all of that stuff. And then also just like galvanics, you know, all the labby stuff. But they could literally sit with you for 20 minutes and be like, you guys aren't going to make it. You'll make it seven years. They'll make it 14 years. And I mean, like, can you imagine the stress? <laughs> like the worst dinner party guests ever. Um, <laughs> but what's rad about what they did is they also became known for, like kind of in the 90s when divorce was hockey sticking, this idea of the, the magic ratio, which is five to one. And so the way that that works is for every um, five positive interactions that you have, it's okay if there's one bad one. And what was interesting about this is it was like basically agnostic to coupling style. People were like, oh my God, if we like, you know, fight all the time, but we make up all the time, is that better than and if we're like conflict averse or is it worse or like who's going to make it was like the, the fear, like people care about their relationships and they were like, it doesn't matter. What matters is the ratio. It's like the, you know, people have used like the piggy bank, um, you know, putting points in the bank and all that stuff, other metaphors for it. But I think what's interesting about that is I've run a lot of research saying, well, if we're in a paradigm where this is, this is the interface and it's relationship driven, then like the rules for relationships and what works should borrow over here. And what I found is like that five to one metric bears out. Yeah. So when you're designing the research, how are you asking the right narrative questions to get at the truth? How are you, I mean, like I immediately am like, oh my God, I wonder if people with Poncho are going to be like, um, how's the side hustle going, man? Like in the morning, like if I were to get a text from him, I'd be like, how's it going? And these types of things, how do you design for that messy space mm -hmm. and at the same time be looking at the really core uh, architectures of, of what feels right in a relationship. The five to one is just like when it feels right. Yep. Um, I feel like I'm constantly trying to find ways to put pins on things that like are the most uncomfortable weird parts of being human. Yeah, you know, I, can I just say when we designed the Poncho bot, 
I've never heard of that five to one ratio. None, I'm sure none of the team knows it. But we just decided that we had to basically, if you ask Poncho, the Poncho bot a question about the weather, we had to understand it 80% of the time. And if we couldn't do yeah. that, then we weren't succeeding. Yeah. And so it's kind of funny that that we just, but we as collectively sat around and we were like, that's the metric that we have to go for. That's such a good point too, because I think you guys intuitively got there. And that's kind of the like, you know, head bleep of this space mm -hmm. is like, if you, if you really like check in, if you if you drop in, you we all know the answers of what feels good, what doesn't feel good, what we believe, what we don't, what story like actually like. I mean, literally using your app, I was like, oh my god, it's not loading fast enough. <laughs> like, why doesn't the story text me faster? Mm -hmm. And that sense of when when you're in it versus when you're out of it. And I think it's how do we find metrics that actually match that yeah. versus being driven by what's the like, what's the actual best metric for this thing we can kind of get lost in our heads right. like a big thing i talk about is how we often think that we're designing for people's modes like you know airplane mode this that what game mode stress mode i think what's funny is people when they like a research project I ran that you know about was um, I was like, okay, it's really weird to ask people what their ideal flow of information is for notifications and this, that, and the other. And people were kind of asking me about the tray. And I was like, okay, forget the tray. Like I went to people and was like, you know, you know what airplane mode is? Give me like 10 more. And all of their modes were moods. They weren't modes at all. So just that like little, the extra O makes yeah. a difference. I think like intuitively being like, oh, I think that's right. How yeah. do I make a metric for that? Yeah. You talked about um, kind of, you know, maybe mimicking a great relationship where you've got kind of this, you know, good ratio of positive and negative. But in that paradigm, you know, you as a person in that relationship, you're, you are yourself. You can't, you're not a machine. You can't switch who you are and have an equally effective relationship with somebody else. You can do that in your product, right? So you can be a different person to it to one user and another to, to another user. Is that, I guess, how do you think about that when you're building, and you know, for others in the audience who are either building your own natural language interface or you're just kind of thinking about your brand personality, do you stay as one brand or do you mimic whatever the user wants and what are the trade-offs there and how do you guys think about that? Yeah, well, I'll jump in here and yeah. say that um, one interesting thing that happened in the past year with Hooked that we noticed is that when we first started collecting stories for the app, um, our main goal was to get stories that were super addicting because we were like, okay, goal is to get people to read. How do you do that? You need like BuzzFeed of fiction. You need it to be super <laughs> addicting. People want to tap, get to the end. And so when we first started out, we incentivized authors for that particular metric, the metric of success we were measuring was completion rate of stories. And so we collected a bunch of stories that had really high engagement and we, you know, we thought all was going well. And then we ran sentiment analysis um, after we had a good collection of stories, I think about like 200, 250 um, on the comments and the likes to loves ratios and like, you know, the word, the positive to negative words in the comments. We just, you know, ran a huge analysis of can we gauge what people actually feel about this story? And what we learned um, is that people hated cliffhanger endings. <laughs> they were so angry that they would get to the end of a story and it wouldn't have this like resolute kind of satisfying ending and they felt almost betrayed. And so what we saw is that, well, first of all, it's really hard to write a good ending to any story. That's just like a challenge of writing a good fiction story, but it's particularly challenging in a compressed format with um, the goal of being super engaging in such a short amount of time. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board and we're like, okay, this is clearly important from an emotional perspective for our, our readers. And so we changed our incentive structure and, and asked authors to revisit their stories and then moving forward, like really invest in thinking about how to write endings with more closure. Um, and then we re-ran the sentiment analysis and user satisfaction just like shot way up. And so I use this as, as an example because I think it wasn't, though in retrospect it's obvious, it wasn't something we were really thinking about in the beginning. Yeah. And this was something we heard from our readers, you know, like across the board that they wanted. And so we did sort of maneuver ourselves to cater to that because what it taught us is that measuring based on just one metric, engagement isn't enough. We have to always ask ourselves with every story, what is the emotional experience that this person is potentially having with this piece as a whole? Is it good or is it bad? And if it's bad, we need to figure out how to make it good. Yep. Um, yeah, I imagine, I don't know if uh, any 
media producers are in the room, uh, and Netflix, uh, I have a bone to pick with every original content piece because everything is a cliffhanger, and it forces you to keep, keep staying addicted to a specific uh, show. But I mean, I think it goes back to you know, whether users are not necessarily always having a, a, a positive feeling after their interaction with your product, and is that, do you always want to make the user happy? I guess I know that's a strange question, but uh, you know, in real life, the people who you want to be around all the time don't always kind of just kind of placate to your to your you know every need to keep you smiling. Um, I think in the in the IDEO study, there was the example of somebody who said they wanted somebody to challenge them or kind of you know not not let them get away with um, doing whatever they want. Is that something that you can build in and should build in, build into products? I don't know if this is maybe this isn't the exact same question you're asking, but we we've, we've looked we look at a lot of the digital assistants because Poncho is kind of a digital assistant in mm -hmm. some ways, and one of the things we consciously decided we didn't want to do with Poncho is make him too accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think that one of the um, one of the issues with digital assistants is that they're they're pretty subservient, mm -hmm. and um, and when and because they all have female personalities, it's sort of like even worse. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it just there's just some. I think they can get a little creepy, and they're also not human because human. Except the Google Assistant, right? Uh, the Google Assistant <laughs> is, is I like the Google Assistant <laughs> because it's so dry. Like it's sort of <laughs> it, it feels more robotic in a, in a good way. But um, like it's not trying to do anything else. But I think that the um, Are you saying this because I'm sitting right next? <laughs> <laughs> but I think the Google Assistant has a certain dryness. I really do mean that. That the in a, in a positive way. Like it's not pretending to be a person exactly. But the um, but I think that with um, with Poncho, we decided like he he's going to be somebody who you're not. He's not your best friend. He has his own things to do. So even little messages sometimes, like if when you talk to the chatbot, and he's like, "Hey, I was charging my phone. Sorry, you know, I didn't see you there or something like that." But, like we wanted to have why? his own thing. Like was that? An, sorry to interrupt you, but was that an obvious choice to think of him as you didn't want him to be your best friend? We didn't want him to be servile. We wanted him to be someone who you wanted to be friends with. Like he was like a little cooler than you, and you were sort of like <laughs> trying to like you know that we wanted to have that relationship because we thought that was just more intriguing and would sort of people would be, we always want people to kind of try to know more. Now that being said, we want their reaction when they've used Poncho, like our user promise is that sort of moment of zen in the morning. And, you know, we think about what that, our use case is basically morning use, so the average user, we have like two sessions a day per user, but um, we think about that morning use case as fundamental, and we want, the, especially now, like things have just gotten worse, like you dread opening your phone, you, you know, <laughs> who knows what's in the news, we just want that moment to be, um, to leave you with a little bit of a smile, and that's kind of our brand promise, so if we don't, um, if we don't succeed there, then we're not, we're not delivering what, what we've promised to do. Yep. Okay. I think another way to answer your question, too, and is about, um, like, the the identity being elastic, having right. a sense of elasticity to it so that it can change over time in a narrative mm -hmm. arc, so that it can change in skills that are added or things like Poncha's side hustle. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's the thing that we n know to be like most true about humans is that we change and we're never one thing. And just when we think we figured ourselves out, we're, yeah. we're kind of not that. Like learning and growing and figuring it out and not feeling like you have anything figured out and like the human experience being like this, whether yeah. you screenshot it as a day or whether you look at it as a movie arc. Mm -hmm. I mean, Boyhood and E.T. are two of the, like I have two four minute edits for both of those that I use constantly when I talk about machine learning. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that we understand growth and change and variability and personality and when things are great and when things suck and the fact that all of that's welcome. Yeah. We understand that in the context of each other and stories. And if you can apply backstory and background yeah. and narrative and like tech isn't perfect and assistance won't be perfect mm -hmm. and the weather is unpredictable and mm -hmm. maybe punch is mysterious or you know the assistance this or that I think just that sense of the best speakers the best films the things that really move you and you feel connected to that bond is because they make you feel a little bit of everything yeah and I think that little bit of everything is something that you design in with a light hand but 
an assistant that is a cheerleader and is always kind of a positive thing would like drive you crazy. It would be like Reese Witherspoon from election following him around. Like, <laughs> no, right? So I think um, we often want to go to the positive high note place, mm -hmm. but that's not where we live. So how do we get really authentic and vulnerable about that and like designing for those spaces with these, I mean, the thing about devices and our experiences with these presences now is it's 24 seven, the on off switch is a joke. They're everywhere. So we need a lot more um, granularity and gradient in that aspect of the experience yep. emotionally now. Yeah. We only have a couple of minutes. I would love, I, I don't know how many of you in the audience do a lot of thinking in the space or if you already have, you know, kind of ways to measure longer term empathy, emotion, all that. Um, if not, you know, what would you guys give as advice, uh, you know, as you guys have started thinking about this, if you were doing it again from scratch or just starting this, what are some things that you would recommend to anyone in that position? Um, I guess this is maybe going to sound generic. We as a team internally often are debating which direction to go. It's usually a 50-50 split mm -hmm. and we'll have emotional reactions to what we think we should do. Um, but then we always just kind of settle back into just testing it and, and, and seeing what the results are. But when they're close, um, taking it with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. you know? And so like for the ending of stories, ultimately financially, it wasn't a great decision because mm -hmm. we had to pay our authors more for the same amount of, of stories. But like, like we decided that kind of based on just like the negativity surrounding the emotional experience for our readers that it might be something worth doing and even though maybe there isn't an actual um, data point around how it's increased our revenue from a, 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 like you know yep. from that perspective the point is users seem happier and so therefore for us it's a win and so I think I don't know there's not like it emotions are like Danielle's saying it's you can't measure them yeah. with quite as much granularity and so you I trust think your intuition you just have to trust your intuition yeah. it's like does this thing make me feel shitty or does it make <laughs> me feel good you know and if the answer <laughs> is like pretty clear I feel like that should be the thing that helps you point your arrow in either direction. Cool. Sam, Danielle, do you guys have words of wisdom for new entrants to the space? Um, I think, well, I'd say like two things. Like we all know that moment in the movie where you're like, don't go in there. <laughs> There's this thing where I think as we're designing stuff, it's like when you're following your feelings, when you're in an experience, like your intuition, whether you're someone that like acknowledges that or not is in play. Right. And I think when we tend to design stuff, we look at it within the container. So it's like blow away the container. Yeah. And then I think the other piece of that is the invitation for you as a, you know, in whatever function or discipline you're in is to, to like we really do need to tap all of our humanity as we're working on these things. Like we, with this interaction space, you're not just um, the designer, the researcher, the PM, the whatever. You've got to bring the human piece because it's the mess that's going to make this stuff believable. Right. It's going to make it compelling and it's going to make it welcome. Because I think the, the end game of all of this that's potentially there is like, um, this world can either feel really harmonious with all of these kind of helpful agents and friends and things. It's like your social circle expands mm -hmm. or it's like total schizophrenia. So right. that's like where, you know, in 1987, like Apple had their HCI principles and we're like, here's how this needs to work. And I think we're all, we're working on that uh, recipe together right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just say I've always wanted to, I was a philosophy major in college, so I, I'm going to quote Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, and uh, probably never been done in a, a Google event before, but he had this thing where he said, like, you should if you treat people ethically, you should treat them as ends in themselves, not as means to an end. Mm -hmm. And I do think about that in terms of like app design and product design. You know, we shouldn't think of our of our users as means to like our end, where we're mm -hmm. trying to drive certain metrics. You know, we try to think, okay, what do they want to do, and are we helping them do that? And that's yeah. kind of our that's our fundamental yeah. design principle. Wise words. Thank you all so much for for joining us. Um, uh, in a segue, we're actually going to be talking to Brad, uh, or Brad is going to be talking about the assistant, so uh, very relevant to this conversation. Um, yeah, thank you again. Thanks, everyone, for being here.